James chapter 4. Today is July 4th, 200 and how many years ago would that be? Huh? 245 years. Man, I bet the ink's finally dried on that. In the, um, in the National Archives building, there are three primary documents they hold for everyone to see. They're very well guarded. They're protected both from uh, anybody touching them plus the, the air that could corrupt them. We're trying to preserve those original documents for as long as possible. Uh, we do have many copies of those documents in case those documents were to go away, but they are national treasures to us. They are the Declaration of Independence, the letter that we sent to King George uh, on July 4th, dated July 4th, 1776, signed by the, uh, the delegates that were there at that time. We also have the original Constitution uh, that was penned by our forefathers. And that was to become and was ratified by the, by the 13 colonies to become the law of the land. And then shortly after that, there was a realization that the Constitution itself was less than adequate in, and watch this now. This is what I like. It was, it was not adequate in uh, protecting the rights of the citizens. If you read the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Constitution of the United States, you will find out that those ten amendments had nothing to do with giving the government more power. It had everything to do with protecting the rights and the power of the citizens of the United States of America. I don't know if you ever thought about that or not, but that's what it's all about. That's why those three documents remain, aside from the Bible, the three most important documents I would say not just in this country, but in the world. Because there is not a nation like America that guarantees that it will not infringe on the right, not that the government gives, but that God gives. It will not infringe on the right that God gives mankind his right to keep and bear arms. In other words, to protect himself and to defend his liberty and defend the Constitution of the United States. You know, our politicians swear and oh, saying they will protect and defend the Constitution. Very few of them even come close to meaning it. They don't care about the Constitution. They care about power and money. That's why they get in politics to begin with. Because they know now that there's so many ways of cheating the American taxpayer. Why not get involved in it? Because they can get into it and almost never get caught almost never get caught. Do you think Beetlejuice of Chicago, do you think she's loyal to the Constitution of the United States of America? Do you think she's loyal to the American flag? Do you, by the way, that, that hammer throw athlete, they should have hammer threw her out 
of the Olympic trial. Those two other gals should have took her and slung her around and tossed her out. If you don't know what, boy, that made me dizzy. If you don't know what I mean by that, three, they're having the Olympic trials now in, in Portland, Oregon. And these three American, the top three, there was a, a gold, a silver, and a bronze. And the bronze winner was an African-American lady who, when they played the national anthem, she turned her back, put her hands on her hips like this in an act of defiance against the nation that just awarded her a medal. Take the medal, send her someplace where she feels like she'll get social justice. Send her somewhere else as far as I'm concerned. By the way, she didn't win the right to represent America from what I heard. We're talking about prayer. Here's what we've learned so far. This is, goes, goes all the way back from the beginning. God teaches us that we should pray always in every situation, good or bad, for ourselves and for others. And I'm telling you this morning, there are people in this room who need you to pray for them. Because they find it difficult to pray for themselves. Number two, God teaches us that he has always been known as the God that hearest prayer. Number three, God teaches us that he, the Holy Spirit, helps us to pray that we do not know what to pray, how to ask, because of sin in the flesh. A secondary thought, name someone in the Bible who, that read a prayer to God. In other words, out of a book. The answer is no one. What, we, uh, what else we've learned out of prayer from last week? Prayers are useless without faith. Which is why I said people who go around in a religious ceremony reading prayers, those prayers are read Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Do you think if you read a prayer every Sunday for 30, for 30 years straight that you even even think about what it is you're asking anymore? So does God even hear that prayer anymore? I just don't think so. I think liturgical prayers ought to go out the window. And I think if you're going to have church service, the man that leads the prayer ought to be praying out of the abundance of his heart and not what some denomination told him to read out of a prayer book. Prayers are useless without faith. Number two, leave off worrying. <laughs> Easier said than done. But I can tell you that I've, I've tried to be more thoughtful, more prayerful, more th thinking about, instead of worrying about a situation, asking God to help with the situation, and then trying to leave off worrying about it, letting God handle it. There is nothing sinful about asking God to bless your best or your worst efforts. I, I am not at my best today. Not at my best today. God is our friend. The one who sticks is closer than a brother. We have nothing. God has everything. So if you need something, who are you going to go to ask? The one who has everything. And God rewards diligence in prayer. You know what that's like to me? It's like a mother who has a rebellious child. Who when they are calling you saying, I don't know what to do with this kid anymore. I get on to him. I yell and scream. Well, have you tried spanking him? Well, I did it once and it didn't work. How many times do you have to spank a child for something? 
until they quit doing it. Now you say, if that's mean, that's cruel, that's evil. How many times does God spank you for doing something? Until you're done doing it. And God's not being mean to you. God is loving you. So you won't do that stuff no more. And God rewards diligence in prayer. Now, today, very quickly, I believe that you ought to pray for government and authority. It's July 4th. We're celebrating our independence from King George. The issue was that King George was levying taxes, heavy taxes upon our people, but was not giving us any voice or representation in how these colonies were being ruled. He had hired uh, militant, so what do they call them? Uh, not militias. Um, hired soldiers of fortune, something like that. He had hired Hessians, some of the Germans, to come over here and basically just start shooting. At that point, he had abdicated his own authority over his people because he was having them slaughtered and murdered. And those people had an absolute right to defend their farms, defend their families, and defend themselves and defend their liberties. So, this, what I'm going to preach to you this morning applies to government authority, it applies to an individual life. What is the authority in your life? Who rules over your life? So on. It applies in a family. Who is the authority in the family? It applies in the workplace. Who is the, who is the workplace authority? Are you the boss at work? Or you just pretend to be the boss at work? There's somebody here that works at a place where there's an old woman there, an old hag. And she has absolutely no authority whatsoever in, in the place where they all work. And yet she... She feels like because she's older than everybody else that she can boss everybody around, tell them what to do. And I don't know if she still works there or not because the last I heard, they, there was so many complaints from the customers about her that they called the boss in. The boss had a talk with her and she let out a few curses to him. That's one thing you don't do is curse the boss out and expect to get a raise next week. But this will also apply in the workplace. James chapter 4, if you're already there, say amen. You have a Bible in front of you. James chapter 4, verse 2. Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war. I mean, this applies to an individual. This applies to a company. You know, if a man owns a company and he asks God to bless that company and he gives that company over to the Lord, did you know God has the ability to make that company the greatest American success company that's ever been? Do you believe that? Say amen. I can tell you the story of J.C. Penney. I don't remember all of it, but he started out giving 10% of the company's profits that belonged to him that he had ownership of and over time he ended up giving God 90% and him keeping 10% and he was still a millionaire. You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war yet ye have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. Father, help me to preach this message. I'm already aware of the time. I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would give us grace. Help me to give the message, Father, that you would want me to give and say what you want me to say. Father, my heart is very heavy. Our hearts are very heavy. And I just pray, God, that you would help us this morning. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. There's a reason why I like to pray at the beginning of a message. 
is that I know and realize that without asking God for God's help, anything that I say and do won't amount to a hill of beans or bean sprouts or bean hulls to anybody here this morning or anybody out there listening. It'll end up being the worst message or it'll be a message full of the flesh and people will follow it and they will turn wrong. But the main part of this, he says, you ask, you ask, you have not because you ask not, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. There are powers in our government, bureaucrats in just about every form and part of our government, whether it's the federal government, state government, local government, that seek power, that want more authority, that want you as the American people to just keep on working and amass the tax money that they can take from you so that they can figure out ways of stealing it and putting it in their own pocket. There are people who actually live their lives dedicated to politics so they can do nothing but steal. And yet, they're missing out on the fact that if they would turn their life around, live for God, get out of politics, go do something worth doing for a living, that God would actually bless them far beyond anything they could ever amass, stealing it through politics. Somebody say amen. Our own nation, if our national policy uh, toward other nations toward Israel or toward South American nations or toward China or toward Russia. If this nation, if our leaders would fall upon their face before God and say, God, show us how to deal with China. Show us how to deal with Russia. God, we're being threatened by North Korea. We're being threatened by this army. We're being threatened by uh, Muslim militants. And God, we don't want, we don't want to start a war. We don't know what to do. We don't want innocent lives to be taken. But I can tell you, in the last 50 to 60 years, untold millions of innocent civilian lives have been taken in warfares, bullets, bombs that should have never been dropped by this country. Should have never been done. And if our leaders, would have simply prayed and asked God, God lead us. God would have made us a far better country and we wouldn't have the enemies that we have right now. We've got enemies all over this world. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, I want you to turn there. God gives the Christian a responsibility. A responsibility to do one thing concerning your country. Now, back before the election, we all bought us a bunch of bullets. I did. Some of y'all did. We thought there might be a war. Revolutionary or a civil war. And there may be. But let me tell you what would be better for America than us having a war and killing our own brethren. See, our country's already done this before. Between 1860 and 1865, brothers shot and killed brothers. Families killed family members in a civil war. A civil war, I mean, it's one thing to go fight Hitler. It's one thing to go fight Japan. But to fight your own people. Have you thought about that? Have you thought about the ramifications 
of a civil war where you're shooting and killing other Americans. I have, and I don't like it. So here's, God has a better idea. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. How many things are here? Let's count these. Supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. There's four things here. That's always related to the spiritual world, and it's always related to the gospel. Now let me ask you a question. As far as the gospel's sake, and us being able to preach the gospel, which is better? A civil war, or a church praying that God would send revival to America? Which would be better? The revival. That it be made for all men. Including, you know, if you, I don't know if you remember, but for eight years we prayed for President Barack Obama. We prayed that God would move in his, in his heart and then God would save him and that he would lead America in righteousness. I think we ought to do the same thing for Joe Biden. That before he completely loses his mind, that God saves him. God saves Kamala Harris. God saves Alexandria or Ocasio Cortez and teaches her how to not talk. Amen. It says supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority. And I've actually had people tell me that doesn't mean evil authority. That only means good authority. It says all authority. So they're lying. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Who in here wants to see their sons shot and blown up in a civil war? Who in here wants to see our cities blown to bits with Mortar rounds and bombs and dead bodies laying in the streets anywhere. Who, who in here wants to see that? Who wants to be out scrapping for food that we throw away every week? Who wants, to, who wants that to come to America? Because that's what would happen if there was a war in this country. When they had the Nuremberg trial to hold all the Nazi leaders in account for what they did when a lot of the American lawyers and justices and things came over from America to Nuremberg to hold the trials, they marveled because they had seen pictures of the city before the war and now it was just in rubble. And they kept asking, what is that smell? And they were told there's still some 40,000 German people laying in the rubble that we can't get to. That's not the America that I want to live in. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. What is good? Is, is, so if we put a civil war over here or prayer for America over here, which one does God choose? 
Prayer for America. For this is good in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Let me ask you a question. All of those young punks who wrap their face up so that nobody identifies them, wears black shirts, black pants, carrying Molotov cocktails, throwing them at buildings, trying to catch buildings on fire, back when days when they were, and I guess they're still doing it in Portland and in other cities, trying to tear down those cities, all of a sudden pallets of blocks and bricks were showing up in places. Do you all remember that? And they, we knew they were hiring Antifa thugs to go and to destroy these buildings, to start the fires. My cousin... Uh, Jim owns a pawn and gun shop out in Zebula, North Carolina. The police told him, hey, we just found out that your shop is a target and Walmart. And you better be on the lookout because Antifa is probably going to try to burn your building down at some point this evening. Well, he had guys not he had guys day and night standing around, standing there in the front with guns ready to shoot those people. Now let me read this verse again. Who would have all men to be saved to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Which would God rather have? You shoot them so they don't burn your building down or you pray for them so they get saved so they don't want to burn your building down. So I'm not trying to preach liberal politics here. I'm conservative. I believe in what's right. I believe in America. But I have to be a Christian first. And God told us to pray before we shoot. Turn to Romans 13. Romans 13. Verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. Now, those of you who will watch this online later, I don't care what you think of me, and I don't care what name you call me, and I don't care if you think I'm going to be the guy that's going to tell everybody, go get in the FEMA trucks now and go to work now for the government when the New World Order kicks in. By, and by the way, they got a mark for you. Go get your mark. I don't care what you call me and I don't care what you say about me. I know what God's word says. I'm reading it. And unless my, unless civil government tells me to directly disobey a direct commandment from God, I am under man's legal authority. Thank you for one amen. I don't preach to be popular. I have to preach what's right. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of good to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. This is why we have on our flagpole a police flag because we believe in law and order. Wherefore you must needs be set, verse 5, 
you must needs be subject not only for wrath but also for or conscience sake for this for for this cause pay ye tribute also it means pay taxes for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing I've just read to you the Word of God I'm not going to give much comment on it the Word of God stands as the Word of God stands you can choose to believe it or you can choose to deny it but God says pray now Turn to Acts 13. I'm going to show you a case where this actually worked. Acts chapter 13. This is a case where Paul prayed for someone in authority who could have had Paul jailed and instead the guy got saved. Acts chapter 13 verse 6 And when they had gone through the island of Paphos they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Now, here was a, watch this now. Here's what the Bible's telling you. Here's a man in authority. But in reality, he's not the one making the decisions. Did you know that? Did you know that Joseph Biden... I, to be honest with you, I think he's incapable of making decisions. I think he is told what to sign, told what to say, told how to... They showed, they showed a, a, a close-up of a card that he took to the G7 conference of what he was supposed to say to everybody. In, even in the Bible... The king who was in authority very rarely made decisions on his own. King Ahasuerus, once he listened to Haman, was going to have all the Jews killed. But once he listened to Esther, and then he listened to Mordecai, he saved all the Jews and had Haman killed. But he didn't make those decisions on his own. People went to him counseled with him and said, this is what you ought to do. Now watch this. This man, Sergius Paulus, has got a, a guy practicing witchcraft telling him what to do. And so more than likely, he's going to do whatever this guy, whatever his agenda is, he's going to do what he's going to do because that's all he's got. But here comes old Paul. Paul shows up Bar Jesus, the, the witch, the, the wizard, knows who Paul is and immediately begins to work against him. And the deputy, Sergius Paulus, says to Paul and Barnabas, I want to hear more of this gospel that you're talking about. I want to hear the word of God. So, verse 8, But Elimus the sorcerer, for so his name is, by interpretation withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all, of all unrighteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy... When he saw what was done, believe, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now who's the deputy going to listen to? He's going to listen to the word of God, isn't he? My point is this. I've got a safe full of guns and ammunition that for the rest of my life I'd like to keep locked up and never use except to just shoot stuff, Todd. Shoot stuff. 
Because it's fun to shoot stuff, isn't it? But to pull the trigger on another human being, I never want to do that. Wouldn't it be better to pray? And let me ask you a question. Do you think God hears the prayer of one person praying for their country? Of course he does. He heard Elijah's prayer. He heard Moses. In fact, Moses was the only one praying on behalf of the children of Israel. And God listened to Moses every single time. And there are numerous examples, too many to give, about men who prayed for who was in charge of the government. And God changed the will of those in government. And God got his way in that land and in those people. And we are still serving the same God. Do you believe that? Say amen. This is Taylor May Griffin. She was actually named after her great grandma, May, M A E. Turn your Bibles while I'm doing this, turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Taylor was born January 7th, 2005. She was just 16 years old. Caleb first started talking to Lisa and I about her. And of course we're going, well, we'll have to meet her. She was very shy, very timid, very respectful to Lisa and I. We gave them rules to follow. I said, if you want to have a relationship and you want that relationship to grow, then here's how we want you to do it. She passed away June 30th. While we were at camp, Caleb was staying with some members of our family and we told him that if, yeah, if Caleb's there and you guys are there, then Taylor can come over and sit and visit. Kind of like old-fashioned courting is what we kept him to. She was, seemed to have a happy-go-lucky attitude about most things in life. Of course, she was a girl, so there was things that she was afraid of, things that she was, made her uncomfortable. And I got comfortable enough with her that I could scare her. What that means is, my girls will tell you that, like Courtney and Lindsay and Alicia, they'd all tell you, I'd pass them while they were in the bathroom doing their makeup, door would be open, 
and catch them off their guard and I'd come back around and slap the door like that and scare them while they had their putting their makeup on. Well, Taylor got comfortable enough with us and comfortable enough with me and I with her is that she was sitting in a room. Caleb was walking down the hall and, and I said, Caleb, wait a minute. So he stood there for a minute and I poked my head in that room and I went, Woo! like that and she jumped and she shook and She started to become part of our family. She loved our grandkids. My daughters became very comfortable with around her. She was born to hard working parents, Robert and Jamie Griffin. We met them. Found out that they shared many of the same values as Lisa and I. She has a younger sister, Michaela, and a little brother, Colton. Caleb actually met her at Hillsboro High School. She got a job working for Fredericks, and that's where Caleb, that's how Caleb ended up working over there. She got him a job over there. And they worked. They work, it's almost like it, a marriage was forming because they were learning to work together. Caleb has always been very open and honest with me. Early on he would ask me, so do you like Taylor? I said, yeah, I do. I said, anything I don't like, I'll, I'll tell you, Caleb. And I said, I want you guys to have a, a good, healthy relationship. And when the time's right, I told him, Melissa, what Ken Goff taught us. I said, my old preacher taught us never date anybody that you wouldn't marry. What that means is, you don't just go hopping around from girl to girl to boy to boy to boy. Doing things with them, just, just to have fun with them for a while. If you're going to go out with somebody or date somebody or be a couple with somebody it should be somebody that you wouldn't mind marrying because what you're doing is you're working on committing yourself to that person for the rest of your life and Caleb asked me one day just a few weeks ago Dad, do you think Taylor and I make a good couple? I said, son, I believe you do. I found out she had a TikTok page. I've never been on TikTok, but I went looking through some of hers, and apparently she likes to have a lot of fun with TikTok. Just recently, she sent Lisa a text message. I could tell that Taylor was getting, she was bonding with Lisa. And that's a good sign when you marry a wife or you marry a, somebody's son, you're going to marry into that family. family. And if you're going to have bitterness with that family that's probably not going to work too it's not probably, probably not going to work too well but she was bonding with us really really well she sent Lisa a text the other day and said hey 
I just wanted to say I love you and your family very much. Caleb is the first guy to ever treat me right and actually love me. You have, you have an amazing son. When she was over visiting Caleb, she left, I guess, because the, the weather was coming in and she just lives just down B Highway in, in Rain Tree Plantation, not too far from where Caleb was staying. And I guess they said, maybe you ought to go, the weather's starting to get bad. So she left. And after about 40 minutes, Taylor's mom called Caleb and said, do you know where Taylor is? No, she left here about 20 minutes ago. So Caleb and somebody went riding down B Highway to try to find her. They got as far as... Uh, it's Butcher Branch, where the state maintenance shed is. Traffic was already stopped there. And that, of course, meant that there was something going on up the road. Caleb got out of the car, found out that there was an accident up ahead and involved a young lady. Caleb ran a mile down to the scene of the accident where he saw Taylor's car she had lost control in, in the thick water and hit the front of an oncoming truck. Was stuck in the car. Taylor's mom and dad showed up. And Taylor, Caleb acted like a grown-up. Because he knew that her little sister and little brother were there. And Caleb was telling them, because they could see the accident. Caleb was telling them, come over here and sit down and take deep breaths. Just relax. That's not what boys do. That's what adults do. Caleb was able to hold her hand. He kissed her and told her he loved her. And then the firemen moved him out of the way. And they had to cut her out of the vehicle. She had broke both femurs. And the femur bones cause blood clots. And she died at the hospital that night of a blood clot. Lisa and I didn't find out about it till the next morning. We were finally able to get in touch with her mom who had to give us the bad news. This was the young lady that Caleb was already in his heart developing a man's way of keeping himself only to one woman. He was already doing that. In today's world, most teenage boys, they're just from girl to girl. But she had dedicated herself to him and Caleb had dedicated himself to her already. They were, I know they were young. But in that, they exhibited great maturity. Her visitation will be 
Tuesday from 3 to 8 at Chapel Hill Funeral Home. Service will be Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Of course, Lisa and I will be there. And I would like for us to come and pray. Uh, oh, by the way, they had a memorial service, a prayer service at Raintree Church. Because they lived in Raintree. And Caleb asked me, he's, can I go to that? And yeah, I, I drove him down there. We had just got back from camp. And so I didn't go to that. But when I came back at 8 o'clock to pick Caleb up, the pastor um, came out. I introduced myself. I'm Caleb's dad. I pastor Bethel Church here. And he said... That Taylor gave her life to the Lord when she was about 10. And he said, I baptized her here. So my hope and prayer is that she was serious with the Lord and that she's in heaven now. So I want you to pray for the pastor. I've had to preach funerals like this. They're not easy to do. Pray for the Griffin family. Pray for our family. Because this is pretty hard on us. Pray for Caleb. I don't think too many of us at 17 years old had to ever go through anything like this. So I'd like to call you down. I know the hour is late. It's 4th of July. Won't get dark till 9 o'clock tonight anyway. We're not going to have a service at 3. So I'd like to ask you to come down and let's join in prayer.